Well, hello and welcome. Welcome back to another happy Monday of demystifying post-production. Um, Simon Walker here. I'm head of training and learning at Maxon. And we've also got on the line, we've got Dustin and Ian and Darren as well. Hi, guys. Hello. Good hello. morning. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, now, all. We, we normally like to show you our shining faces on these things. <laughs> <laughs> but to, 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 to um, spare you the technical details, for some reason, none of our webcams are working this morning. So it's, it's a bit like that thing, sorry, computers and the camera's not working. So we have brushed our hair, we've had have our coffee and tea already, and we're ready for this, but we, we apologize for not showing us. But the important thing is that you can see what we're going to be sharing. A bit like a radio show this time. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yes. So, and what we're going to be sharing is this. We're going to be looking at week three of sculpting your own assets with ZBrush. And we exciting, you've got something interesting and spooky to show us, which is hand related, I believe, Ian. Yeah, yeah. And it's going to be really cool because nobody here needs to know anatomy. I'm just going to squash that real quick. You don't need to know anatomy for this um, because we're going to be taking assets and I'm going to show you where assets live within ZBrush. And then we're going to be just taking what we need and then uh, manipulating it to our favor. Sounds fantastic. And regular viewers or listeners, I should say this week, a radio show in 3D color. Thanks, Jim. That's, that's a great point to make. So just, just for the record, you, you know what to do here. Just go to the events page on the Maxon site and you can see all these amazing events that we've got coming up. And I'll just tell you a little bit about them before we jump in with Ian. But if you happen to be at Adobe Max this week, a bunch of us will be there showing workflows that are really interesting for 3D and 2D in After Effects and related tools. And also simultaneously, we're also doubling up because we'll be at the 3D Motion Show at NAB New York, where we'll be streaming events and presentations. So please log on to that so you can do that remotely. And we've got more shows this week. Max on Color is running another session on Thursday. And also we've got another VFX and Chill on Friday. And also if you're in uh, Japan, you, you can find out more about our user meeting. So we'll have some fun stuff there too. And as always, if you want to see the recording, you can hop over to the Maxon training team on YouTube and see the recordings, including the last couple of weeks where we've got the Sculpt Your Own Assets with ZBrush weeks one and two. And um, also, hi to everyone on the chat. Hi, Hannah, Marcelo. Hey, Drake. Hi, Josh. Josh. Hi, Jim. Hi, Brian. Um, good morning from Seattle, Brian. I hope you're enjoying this unseasonally clement weather in the Northwest, where I am as well. And um, then also, don't forget, we've got the ability to um, snap up one of those free T-shirts. So there's the usual info. This PDF is in the handout section of this GoToWebinar webinar. So please download it from there as well. And also the resource, for shared resource location where Ian has been uploading what he's been doing as those project files. Thanks again for doing that, Ian. And those that's the downlink for those as well. All right. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as Jim says, Michigan rocks. Absolutely. We totally agree, Jim. <laughs> Great. So I'm going to not delay any more and send the screen over to you, Ian, so you can tell us a bit more about what you've got planned for today. Sweet. All right. I'm going to share my screen and let me know if you guys can see that. Oh, yes. It's oh, welcome to Halloween. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is the project that we started building since um, the first Monday of this month. So if you haven't seen any of those, we definitely encourage you, like Simon said, the VODs are up and active over on the Maxon channel. So definitely go check that out. But this is the project that we're slowly working towards building. And as we're building it, we're using ZBrush and we're learning ZBrush all at the same time. I'm a big philosopher of, you know, learn by doing, and ZBrush is definitely one of those programs that really benefits the ability to just get in there and try something. Don't be shy, don't be bashful. Let's just make something happen, even if it's complete, you know, just utter, ah, I don't care. It, it's just getting used to the program by using it, 
Um, it's about creating art and having fun. So today we're gonna be covering this hand and how I went about making it. And then also too, if there's some time, um, we'll cover making the ground. But as you can see, it's just literally a blob with just some rough texture that literally happened from brushes. Like there's nothing special that really happened here. Probably looks way more complicated than it actually is. So we're gonna go ahead and get into this today. So let's just start. So we're gonna put this up here in the corner. And for those of you who don't know, if you have a model you wanna reference or you have a project that you wanna showcase while you're working on something else, you can actually just move your model over to like, let's say here, the top left-hand corner of the viewport and hit shift S, so shift S, and we'll do like a little 2.5D stamp because ZBrush is primarily, well, it started as a painting program that moved into digital sculpting. You have the ability to constantly just stamp your 3D model into a spot and you can't manipulate it, but it's a good visual reference. And if you ever wanted to clear that, let's say you had way too many or you accidentally hit it and you're like, I don't know what to do, just hit control N and that will clear the canvas and it'll clear all those stamps. And then you can go ahead and just replace it again where you would like and shift S and that will stamp it. So it's really good to just kind of stamp some reference. Or two, if you want to solo out a certain object and work on a thing. I do this a lot when I'm streaming. You'll pop in be like, what are you working on? It's over here. It looks there. And then I'm just sculpting. So that's a really neat little trick. But let's go ahead and let's actually showcase where I got this hand from. Because again, I said you don't need to have any type of anatomy. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit the comma key on the keyboard, which will bring up the light box. And you can see here, we have a few different projects. Now again, having uh, loading a project will completely, you know, kind of kill everything that I have loaded in already and then start a new project. So we don't really want to do that, but we can come over to tool and we have a couple tools here that we can load. And these are different than a project because it's just, like I said before, you have different canvases under your tool menu. At least that's what I call them. So we can actually load a new tool by double tapping this and that loads like another canvas for you. So you have multiple projects you're working on at the same time. And we're gonna go ahead and hit comma to close that. And now you can see here, I have this epic naked man and he's ready to have his arms ripped off in good old hand Halloween fashion. So, but now that that's loaded, we can open up the subtool menu and you can see here we have quite a bit of subtools and we just need this hand. So if you ever load a project or a tool list that you wanna remove all the other subtools and keep the one that you have engaged right here, you can actually come on down to this delete other and clicking this one time will delete all the other subtools except for the one you have selected. And now I'm gonna go ahead and just take his hand off. So if I hit Shift F, as in Frank, that's gonna show up my polyframe, or there's this button right here that actually allows us to do that as well. And you can see that this model is actually pretty well subdivided. Um, it has a lot of different poly groups, and it has some subdivisions as well, which we can see if we go to the geometry. And actually, this one didn't have subdivisions. Never mind, I'll lie to you again. So there's no subdivisions on that, which is actually really nice though, because again, it's already pretty low. Um, it was actually had dynamic subdivision turned on. So if we go here, dynamic was turned on originally, shift F or turning that button on and off, we'll turn that off. So we're gonna go ahead and just isolate the hand of this model. And this is actually, because there's polygroups already, this makes it a lot easier. Where in ZBrush, what we could do is if we hold control shift and tap a polygroup, it's going to select that polygroup and hide everything else. And then if we hold control shift and swipe on an empty part of our canvas somewhere here, it's gonna invert that. So once again, that's holding control and shift, tapping a polygroup we wanna keep. Then while still holding control shift, we're gonna swipe with our pen in an empty spot and that's gonna invert. And then we can still hold control shift and we can also just tap to isolate. That's one way about going about it. Another way you can go about it is actually when we hold control shift, if you notice at the top left of our brush menu, we're actually getting a new brush and that is uh, the select rec, which I believe we covered last week. But what we can also do is pick the select lasso. 
and it's going to come up with this little window that says, hey, you have the select uh, lasso brush. We want to make sure that you hold control shift keys. This is just a good little reminder if you weren't holding those keys to tell you what it is on how to use it. And we can actually come through here and we can select exactly what we want to keep. And as you see, we have this. I actually don't want these three, so I'm going to start to select. But if I press and hold Alt, it'll actually hide those. And now I have that quick selection. So it's a really cool way to isolate something. And now we're going to go to our sub tool. I'm sorry, we're going to go to geometry, modified topology, and we're going to go to delete hidden. And now that's going to go ahead and delete all the other layers. Now, this actually said that there is a pop up with this tool that says this has layers or it has some other information, so it won't be able to delete those. And that's okay. ZBrush actually will tell you exactly what's going on if a pop-up ever happens. Um, don't be so quick to dismiss these because it's trying to guide you to let you know that there's something else going on with that tool and why the action may not be working. So if you ever get one of these pop-ups, go ahead and read it and say, okay, this has bake or delete all layers and try again. So what that means is I just have to come to this menu here under layers, and it has these layers here, and I can actually turn around and delete those layers. And that's actually control z -able, so you can actually get those layers back, but you just go ahead, come in here and say delete, delete. And now we can reselect that one more time, something like this. Now we have this, and we can come to, again, geometry, modified topology, and delete hidden. Before I continue forward, if anybody has any questions, I'll cover those questions. Yeah, so Chad's asking, um, do the sculpts, like when you're sculpting and you have a polygroup hidden, is that going to affect the hidden polygroup? No, that's a great question. So, yeah, let's say I have, so I have this hand here, uh -huh, and I want to sculpt on just this. I can actually isolate this and start sculpting. Doop, 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 doop. Now, if I get to the edge here, it is going to start kind of telling the other polygroup, hey, that is something that, you know, is still connected. So just like any type of topology, if it's connected, it has to go somewhere. But if you're just focusing on just one section, you can hide it and you can work on it. And what's cool is also if you have subdivisions, so I'm actually going to go ahead and add some subdivisions, and I'm going to select this, this one. Okay. Now, what's happening here is it's selecting, actually. Here's, let me explain this real quick before we get into it. So with select rec, uh, with the select rec tool, when you select the polygroup, it's actually going to select the whole polygroup no matter, no matter where I click. But with the select lasso, what was happening right there is if I select the line, it actually allows me to select just a single edge loop. So this is a different function within that. So that's what was happening when you saw me trying to isolate and it was just grabbing a loop. But I'm going to go ahead and grab here. So if I had this divided, you'll actually still see the subdivisions as you're sculpting. So you can I, uh, hide. And it's only going to really affect if you get very, very close. But for the most part, if you're hiding something, you'll be aware of that. So the chances of you you know, uh, messing anything up is actually really slim to none. So um, you can hide it, it. It would kind of affect if you got too close, but it's not going to affect the whole model if you're sculpting over here and then you invert that. Hopefully that answers that question. Any other questions? Uh, I'm going, we have a, a couple coming in um, at the moment. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> how to grow how to grow uh, a polygroup how to grow so, uh, polygroup. once you w once you have a, a polygroup selected is there a way to i'm assuming that this is how to grow the selection um that you currently have so if you have one invisible or say you have one polygroup selected like you do now or a few of them is there a way to very easily just continue the selection and grow that out Ex yeah exactly what you're doing yes absolutely so um, what you could do, so um, if you go ahead and say select this this bunch of loops here, and you select it too much by pressing holding uh, by pressing and holding Control and Shift, just like you would select. If you go ahead and hit the S button while still holding Control and Shift, it's going to shrink it. And if I hit the X button, it's going to grow it. So I can actually grow and shrink a selection. Now for a poly group, which is different than an edge loop. 
Um, if I wanted to actually turn this loop into this color, what I can do is just select those groups, invert them and control W to then change that poly group. So you're not really growing the poly group so much, but for the edge loops, it's control shift S to shrink or, or X to uh, grow. What's also really cool about that is um, if you had multiple, like let's say, I'm gonna go ahead and take this and I'm just gonna invert this. And I'm gonna actually change this to a different poly group. And just to make life a little bit more complicated, I'm gonna go ahead and make that completely separate like this. So what, another cool feature is, let's say I wanted to actually select a, this hand, but this hand is too close. So let's actually mask this off. Let's grab this like this. Let's bring this a little closer. Now, if I wanted to select all this hand, but this is too close, I can select all of this. Pressing Alt, I can hide. Um, it, like I can press the Alt, which will hide the selection. And then if I hold Control Shift and press A, it will bring back all of the visible uh, uh, poly groups for, or, or edge loops for the uh, visible subtool and keep the rest hidden. So again, if I wanted to select this hand, but not this one, but I didn't want to sit here and try to hide every single group like this, because that would just take too long. Go ahead and select everything that you want to uh, keep but, or hide, press Alt to hide it, and then Control Shift A will bring back the rest, and then you can just invert all day long. So that's another really cool way to do that. Awesome, yeah, I think that, that answers uh, pretty well. Uh, covered even more than the initial question, which is great. Uh, looking, <laughs> looking through the uh, the comments, I see that Drake's Drake's making uh, comments slash jokes about so many hotkeys <laughs> in ZBrush. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what you will learn with ZBrush is um, uh, the Control Shift and Alt button are the most used buttons on the keyboard. Um, you get used to it fairly quickly. I would say, like you know. Within my first few days of like using ZBrush, and we're talking like eight years ago, um, it, it did feel a little bit like a, a finger twister, but after a few moments that became very comfortable. And that pretty much like if most of your buttons or your hotkeys are gonna involve the control shift or and or alt key. So um, those three will get used a lot and then everything else will kind of just seem like second nature after a while. So. Definitely, definitely. I, I can I can definitely resonate with that. Um, when I had first started using ZBrush, I actually just kept the hotkeys on another monitor, um, and like forcefully use them often, so that you're you start to build muscle memory pretty quickly. Absolutely. And the other thing too is, um, and I want to point this out just because yes, there are a lot of hotkeys. Um, I mentioned this before, but if you hover over a button and you're not sure if there's a hotkey to it, if you just let it sit there, it will tell you what it is, and then it will tell you the hotkey associated with it if one exists. So, and then you'll, if you also press and hold control, it will also tell you if there's a hotkey, but it'll also um, give you a little bit more insight in that button. So while there are a lot of hotkeys, ZBrush has a way of telling you, like here, this move, this move edit object does not have a hotkey associated with it, but this, floor does, the floor grid is shift P. So I can turn that on real quick or turn that off. So if there is a hotkey and you're like, hey, don't remember, I really want to know what the floor one is, it will tell you, which is really nice. And then again, pressing and hold control will also give you a description of that feature, so. Yeah, so the the last bit here, uh, let's see, Josh is asking, when I try to when I try to delete hidden layers, it says he needs to bake and delete layers and try again. Uh, do you know why that's happening? Like why that uh, prompt will pop up? Yeah, so the prompt will pop up just because it's trying to inform you that uh, there is something else associated with it that will cause the will cause it uh, or prevent it from wanting to be deleted. So to do that, we'll come back over here to our layers. I control Z it all the way back in time for this. So we have our layers here. Um, if you can't delete it, just click on it one time and that will highlight it. And then you could come here and hit an X button or you could say bake all. So there are ways of course that you can go ahead and just bake it to your model, but because we're tearing this model apart and the uh, layers are either uh, mouth open or hands down, which is a little bit of an animation feature, 
a bit advanced. We'll get into that in the future. Um, you could right. just go ahead and just hit the X and get rid of those. And But again, that pop-up is telling you that there is something associated with the model still. So And that's why it's preventing you from deleting that. So you come over to the tools on the right-hand side, layers, select the, and then just go ahead and hit that X button. Or you could just say bake all in its default, and then that will also solve the problem. Awesome. Yeah, we are all set. I, I think it looks like we're caught up here. Okay, so let me just get back real quick to where we were real fast. So deleting uh, hidden by geometry, modified topology, delete hidden. Now the other thing I'm gonna do is, now we only need one hand. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit X on the keyboard. X turns symmetry on and off. You can also find that under transform active symmetry or activate symmetry, and you can turn that on and off there as well. This is good to remember, we covered radial symmetry in our very first lesson, so this is more of a reminder of where that lives, and that's under transform, but X is the hotkey for that. And we're just gonna delete the hand we don't need. Um, in the model, I chose what appears to be the uh, his right, our screen left. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually just delete. So I'm gonna select control, shift, holding, selecting the object I wanna get rid of, pressing and holding Alt at the same time to turn that red, and then going ahead and letting go, and that will hide that. And then again, modify topology, delete hidden. Now, this is what's really cool. We were always talking about um, trying to get our models back to some sort of world center. And I had covered before that world center, the gizmo will snap to the center of the subtool you have selected, and then try to bring it back to the world center. So to do this, we're gonna hit W on the keyboard, we're gonna press and hold Alt, and we're going to tap the unmasked mesh center, which is the little Google icon thing. And that's gonna send that to the center of the subtool. And then letting go of Alt, so now we're not pressing any buttons on the keyboard, we're gonna hit the home button. And that's gonna send our hand back to world center based on the center of, uh, of the subtool. And now we're just gonna position this However, we would like, we can also press and hold alt and rotate the gizmo so that we're actually not mess, uh, rotating the object. So pressing and holding alt basically unlocks it. And then we can go ahead and start positioning this however we would like. I'm gonna press and hold alt and hit this reset button to recenter that to the hand. Maybe put this around his palm and then hit the home just to recenter it one more time. And now we can actually start posing our hands. And so we can actually pose our hands here with all these polygroups. We can have nice selections. Um, so we can actually isolate you know, certain polygroups and then come over, press and hold control and tap on the screen to mask off our object. Or we can come on over to masking and we can actually like try to view a mask or we can press and hold control and select the mask. And then we can bring our objects back, invert by pressing and holding control and tapping one time in the empty space, or again, under masking and hitting inverse. So lots of different ways to approach this. Doesn't really matter how you approach it, whichever is more comfortable. I use, I just, I like to select and then invert all the time, it's habit. And so now what we're gonna do, we also too, real quick, going to a different masking tools. We'll use this one a lot. If we press and hold control, open up our mask menu and then go to mask lasso. This is one of my favorites, by the way, because we can get really nice clean selections. Invert that. And now we can use the gizmo by hitting W again to turn that on, holding Alt to position this. We can actually start to pose our hand exactly how we want. Again, we don't really need to know any anatomy. We already have a hand that's pretty good. We're just gonna go ahead and bring some of this back. We will be breaking this obviously, but with the combination of the move brush, so we're gonna come on up to our brush or hit B to open up our menu, M for move, and then this one is V for our move brush. And we're gonna go ahead and start bringing that up and just repositioning it so it looks pretty good. We can invert or clear our mask. By, uh, if we want to clear our mask, we could just hold control and swipe one time. That will clear it. And then we can go ahead and start pulling out the hand and just getting it situated so it looks pretty good. And you can take your time with this um, because we, uh, we only have an hour. 
you know, we want to just kind of get something that looks pretty close to good. But definitely take your time. No need to rush, especially if you're new to ZBrush. Just focus on making yeah. it look pretty good. Yeah, as we uh, kind of start or continue uh, posing here, uh, let's see. Is there a way to reorient the gizmo to its original original position? Uh, I believe you just covered that, actually. What was the, uh, the hotkey yeah. that you used? So press and hold alt unlock. So I'm going to I'm going to turn on my magnifying glass. So you see this little lock icon? I can either click that one time and that will unlock it and then I can hit this reset button and that will reset. But that's too many steps. What you can do is by pressing alt and pressing and holding alt, it automatically unlocks it for you. So what you can do is press and hold alt and then hit this little basically like reset, recycle, you know, this little circular arrow. Just click that one time while pressing and holding Alt. That resets the gizmo. So even if the gizmo is completely rotated and off over here on some random planet, just press and hold Alt. Go ahead and reset that. That's going to reset its position. And then reset uh, its position to the subtool by hitting this little Google icon button, which is the unmask mesh center. And then letting go of Alt will now retether that back to the subtool. Awesome. And uh, Christian's asking here, what activates the pins on the mesh uh, when you're going to uh, transpose and... So these little pins right here, these pins are actually not activated um, by the gizmo or anything. It's actually a reminder that we're using dynamic uh, subdivision. So if I didn't cover that, um, under geometry, we have a menu called dynamic subdivision. What dynamic subdivision is, is ZBrush's way to showcase what subdivision level three will look like on any model at, at the state of the mesh that is in. So we have a pretty low mesh. And when I'm looking at it normally, I could just click and drag these points and start moving. But when I hit D on the keyboard or just press dynamic, what that does is is actually showcasing the points that the mesh is actually at because subdiv subdividing any model unless you tell it not to, it's going to naturally smooth it, which will naturally shrink it a little bit as well. So if you were to watch these pins right here, focus next to our tombstone project, look at those pins really carefully. And when I turn on or turn off dynamic and turn it back on, you actually see that those pins live right where those points are. So that's just to, uh, an indicator that that's the actual mesh that you're manipulating. If I were yeah. to apply this dynamic subdivision, it's going to give me subdivision level three or four. In this case, it gave me level four. And now those pins go away. So it's just a visual representation of what that looks like at that subdivision. Gotcha. So it's like working with a subdivision uh, subdivision cage of sorts. Yep. It's allowing you to preview. Awesome. Yep. Great question. So I'm going to go ahead and just we'll call this we'll call this done donezo for now, which is pretty cool. And we'll move on to posing. So with posing, with one single subtool like we have right now, we actually um, can just mask off what we want and then we can pose um, however necessary. Um, later, I'm going to introduce a plugin uh, called Transpose Master. And what this will do is allow us to move multiple subtools into one, manipulate it, and then send it back. Um, I don't want to overly complicate that right now, so we'll cover that when we start to wrap the project up. But I just want you to know that that does exist because clicking T-Pose Mesh will actually go ahead and send your entire model with multiple subtools to another subtool temporarily so that we can manipulate it. In this case, it won't let me do that because I only have one subtool at the moment. And that's okay. We don't really need to do that because we're only manipulating the one. But later we'll go over um, this as we get more objects in our scene. For now, just want you to know that it does live there and that's where we'll pay attention to later. For now, we're just gonna be doing kind of what you already saw me do with the hand, but now with the fingers. I'm gonna go ahead and select a, uh, a part of my model, maybe invert that mask. And then now what I'm gonna do is, is show you something really cool, which is being able to have your gizmo snap to a specific spot of your model. And the way to do that is by pressing and holding Alt, we're gonna go ahead and tap one time with the gizmo selected. And that's going to snap our gizmo to a specific point on our model that we choose. 
So I can actually say I need to manipulate this joint or this finger. So I'm going to go ahead and hold Alt, press and hold Alt and tap one time. And then while still pressing holding Alt, I'm just going to position the gizmo kind of more in the middle of where the actual knuckle on your hand would live. And then I'm going to now rotate this up a little bit. Or actually, let's push this. Let's pull this down a little bit more. Rotate this up. It's looking pretty good. We're going to go ahead and push this up there. Something like this. Now, this is why I said Alt is actually one of those buttons that uh, you're going to be using quite a bit because there's a lot of really cool shortcuts for us to come in and position. Now, also, too, the reason why I want to start with the hand is while I said you don't need to have any type of anatomy knowledge, the best be, uh, piece of anatomy to constantly focus on is the hand because most of us will have a hand that we're working with that we can look at and we can reference our own hand and how it moves and how to manipulate or pose just by looking at our own hands. So you can take a look and try to make the pose that you want to see and see how your hand is moving and then try to replicate that by just masking off the section that you don't want to move and then positioning your gizmo always kind of in the middle of your object. It's really going to help you um, move it the way your hand would actually move. And then you can see here, I'm actually moving this. Let's mask this section off here. And then we're gonna go ahead and just start kind of crushing this a little bit. So put this down. And again, take your time with this. There's no need to rush. We're just gonna go ahead and make another selection. Let's actually deselect this. So by selecting with my normal mask, here, I could just hold, press and hold Alt while I'm making that selection. That will actually allow me to um, take part of the mask away. Press and hold Alt to position my gizmo and then start moving the thumb the rest of the way. So you can start to see how we're starting to get something. If we want yeah. to select just the finger. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so well, while you were talking about masking and uh, how to uh, invert add and and all of that, um, I'm not sure if you've covered the smoothing of of your masks. Oh yes, yes, yes. Um, I think I covered it last week, but yeah, as a reminder, because we we're doing this a lot, so, so it's a good reminder. Right. So to smooth the mask, what you can do, so we're going to go ahead and select our mask, and then if you press and hold Control and tap on the model, that actually smooths the mask, kind of softens it, gives you a nice gradient. Um, the other way to do that is make your selection, open up masking, and then go ahead and there is a blur mask or a sharpen mask. So you can sharpen it or you can blur it, you can also shrink it or you can grow it. So those are really good menus to go ahead and, and focus on. Um, however, what I would like to say is when you're moving something like a, a, a human joint. If you look at how your finger moves, there is actually a lot of, there's a lot of like sharp deformation that's happening. While the skin yeah. around it is kind of squishing a little bit, the movement is very sharp. So what we have found is if we make a selection, like let's say right here and kind of invert that, and then if I were to soften this mask and then try to bend it, even if I put the gizmo right where I want it, you can see here I'm getting kind of that noodly effect. And that's not how a finger would move as much as we would probably like it to. <laughs> I mean, that'd be kind of <laughs> cool, like lover status. But what we can it'd be do quite, is, It'd be quite painful if you had a finger like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But here with a sharper mask, what, we, what we've found is that you get a much more realistic bend and some deformation that happens. There's always gonna be a little bit of cleanup in the position, but as you can see here, just already with a little bit of a move brush and a sharp mask, I'm able to get the finger actually kind of folded over and it looks way more accurate. So that's, <laughs> so I recommend using a sharper mask for that, but to soften it, again, press and hold control, tap on the model, or uh, go ahead and come over here to masking and blur mask. Awesome. So Charles is uh, is asking. Uh, you seem to be placing the gizmo 
on the dynamic points, uh, what effect will that have if you ever apply if you ever apply the dynamic points? Um, so it's it's not going to have really much of an effect at all um, because again, if I have my gizmo out and I tap right here on the dynamic point, even if I were to come in and actually uh, apply this, it's now just it's now just representing a more kind of realistic position. You can see there's a little bit of a gap there, but almost minimalistic. Um, because we're posing, I would say definitely keep it as low as you can uh, because it makes posing a lot easier. But it's, again, the dynamic point, it's selecting the true point in which it is at. So even with dynamic turned on, you can see there's a little bit of a gap right there. So it will stay in that position and you would have to reposition it if you apply dynamic. Awesome. So this is going to be a lot more of the same. So um, what we can do, you know, it's really hard. To, I can't just hit a time lapse, <laughs> but you can see how like we can already start getting that pose. So uh, what I'm going to do for right now is instead of having you watch me pose this hand for the next, you know, 30 minutes, we're going to move on to bringing in the ground. But feel free to continue posing your hand and making it look as good or as awesome as you'd want it to make. But again, you're just going to be really just either isolating a polygroup and masking that off and then inverting it and then positioning your gizmo and then going ahead and posing it however you like. And then from there, again, once you get something that you like, you're pretty much set to move on to the next step. But for now, we're going to move on to making the ground. And then if there's any other questions while that's happening, let's go ahead and save, actually. We haven't done that yet. So here, and we're gonna call this hand block out. This is day three. Wee, day three hand block out. Great questions, guys. Perfect. Okay. Now to make the ground, it's actually really, really simple and really, really cool. So we're just gonna go ahead and insert a sphere, cube, cylinder, plane, whichever you would like. If you would like something a little bit more like a rounded uh, kind of ground like what I had over here, what I'm gonna do is insert, so come into Subtool, Insert, and Insert a Sphere 3D. And of course, that's gonna be much larger than our actual hand. So we're gonna turn on the gizmo and that yellow square in the center, that's gonna scale. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and scale this down. And then I'm going to just position this where I want it to be. And I'm going to just take this green little arm here. Again, this is a scale in one direction. And I can actually kind of flatten this out and get this positioned where I would like it to be. So for right now, we'll do this. And now because this is an actual, you know, this has actual topology that we can manipulate, what I'm going to do is utilize the select rec and I'm going to hide the lower half and then delete it. So I'm gonna hit control shift, press and hold it and then grab our select rec brush. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and draw out a kind of rectangular shape of what I want to get rid of. Hover over the spot I wanna get rid of it, press and hold alt and let go, and that will hide the lower half, just like before. And now I'm gonna to go to Geometry, Modify Topology, and I'm going to delete Hidden. Now, this gives me single-sided geometry, in which right now I don't really wanna manipulate just one side of it. I'd actually like this to be closed. So I'm gonna go ahead and say Close Holes, which is under the same menu. And what this will do is give me nice plane. It's gonna kind of close it up. It's very triangulated and not super pretty, but it does do the job. The other way we could do it, since we've already learned Z Modeler, is we can actually open up our Z Modeler brush by hitting B for brush, Z for Z Modeler, and then M. And if we hover over an edge, if you guys remember last week, we press and hold spacebar, and we can actually say close convex hole, let go, and then we could touch that edge, and that can actually give us some nicer topology. Still comes to a point, but it will work. So there are a few ways that you could do that. A lot of us will just use, especially if we're gonna use DynaMesh at some point, we don't really care what the topology looks like. 
again, geometry modified topology, close holes, because then we're just going to open up the DynaMesh and we'll just end up turning that on, which is going to already ruin that topology and give us something that we can rebuild. And obviously, topology for this project is not super important. It's just a way to kind of get destructive and start sculpting. So we're going to actually increase that resolution just a little bit and then say DynaMesh. And now we can sculpt on the surface with our clay buildup, which is BCB, and we can start sculpting and rebuilding our topology by pressing and holding control and dragging on this empty canvas to rebuild. And that's just how we're going to start building our ground. So let's position our ground just a little bit more where we want it to be, maybe a little bit higher and a little bit bigger. Scale that up. There we go. And now this is looking really, really white, and we can't really tell what's going on. That's because my startup material happens to be a skin shade four. You might be working with either red clay or red wax, and or or a basic material. So whichever one you're working with, we're gonna switch over to the basic material just so you guys can see what I'm doing. It doesn't really matter for the project. And now with the clay buildup, I'm literally just going to start building up some of the surrounding area of where this hand should be popping out of. And I'm not really worried too much about what the texture itself looks like. I just want to add a little bit. So, or maybe I wanna subtract by holding alt and just kind of dig Dig around his hand a bit. And this is literally a, most of what I did to get this built in. So we're going to go ahead and just kind of carve that in. If this looks a little low resolution to us, we could just use our resolution slider to increase it a bit and then rebuild by pressing and holding control and dragging. And then we can come back up and add a little bit more. And this is pretty much it for getting the ground. If you do want to see a little bit more textury stuff, we're going to modify, I think we haven't modified a brush really yet so far. So what we could do is grab our standard brush. So that's B for brush, S for standard, and then T. And this is the very first brush that ZBrush usually launches with. And what we're going to do is we're going to modify this. We're going to bring in an alpha and have a little bit of fun with this ground. So I'm going to, underneath the brush, we have a new menu called Stroke. And this gives us different ways that this brush can be applied. And for this one, I just want to hit spray because if I kind of get a smaller brush, you can see here, let's actually build the resolution up just a little bit. You can actually see here, it has a much different effect. It's kind of spraying around. If you just have normal dots, you get a nice clean uh, kind of, you know, application to it. But if we have the spray, it's going to kind of scatter. And that's going to be cool because we can press and hold Alt and we can start kind of cutting in the ground, giving it some imperfection and just detailing a little bit. And if we want to go one step further, we can introduce alphas. So underneath the brush is the, uh, the brush ap uh, stroke application. And then underneath the stroke application is our alpha where now we can bring in alphas and get just a little bit different texture. And this is all I did to get the ground looking a little chopped away or muddied. Awesome. So there, there is a point uh, here that I want to, I do kind of want to bring up um, keeping an eye on time. I know we've only got about 15 minutes. Uh, so Charles is, is uh, kind of making a statement slash question th at the end. Um, I'm assuming that that we're doing this um, not a real use case. Thus far, everything we are doing, I can do it easier in Cinema 4D. Are there common sense guidelines on where ZBrush becomes more effective than standard Cinema 4D modeling? Um, and I was actually getting ready to type out an answer here, but I actually wanted to, to bring up somewhat of a discussion point uh, with sure. you, Ian, um, because being a Cinema 4D user um, and, and kind of, I would consider myself maybe more of a generalist and, and moving back and forth between different software. Um, how do you feel about that? Are there certain times where you may go into uh, Cinema 4D versus ZBrush to do certain things? Um, my answer to this question is definitely have a good understanding of various tools and really know what works best for your either general pipeline or even a project specific pipeline um, to save 
you know, on both ends. <laughs> so do you have like a, a general case where you're like, hey, I'm going to use this tool and then pop over to this one to, you know, expedite a process? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, first off, we're all artists and we all started with a certain program in which we we live with. And a lot of a lot of our audience today, I'm sure, comes from Cinema 4D and that's where they're the most comfortable. So it's it is really easy to say, well, I can do this faster in this program, so I'm just going to stick with that. Um, where ZBrush really comes into play is the fact that it has a high fidelity sculpture rate um, in which you can get massive amounts of detail that most programs have a hard time achieving in that actually affect the geometry. ZBrush lives within the world of you're able to get super high sculptural details quicker and effectively within ZBrush. However, that doesn't mean that another tool that you're really comfortable with can't do that. So yeah, absolutely, to answer your question, I use multiple tools for the pro, for the job um, if I know it's going to be the fastest and easiest way to go about it. Because a lot of um, our audience today may not know what ZBrush is, we have to start at the basics and we have to showcase everything that ZBrush can do so you can understand the possibility of how you'll use that tool in the future. So for right now, if you could build everything up in Cinema 4D that we've built today, and then you're like, all right, but I actually want to 3D print this and I actually want to make sure that the sculptural details live within the, within the geometry, or I want to push this to be super realistic, and that actually might stress Cinema 4D out a little bit, this is where ZBrush comes in, where you can send your model over and you can go ahead and start working on it and getting some more, uh, getting details and stuff that might be a little bit um, either difficult or not as straightforward to apply in other programs. So there is definitely a, a great conversation to be had here that would take up hours upon because yeah. <laughs> it's so cool that, you know, these two programs exist within a world that you guys can have access to. So um, remember that ZBrush is sculpting primarily first and, and foremost. So everything that you'll be doing in ZBrush has a sculptural effect on the actual geometry, where in Cinema 4D, I, if I wanted a more procedural approach, that's where I would pop in there. So it, yeah, like like Dustin said, you, uh, you wanna make sure you have a good understanding of the tools and what it can do and how uh, that tool is best going to serve you within your project. Yeah, awesome. I, I just I'd like to to interject a little bit, you know, just you know, from from industry experience and whatnot. You know, I know that you and I specifically even come from different walks, um, you know, in that space. And it's very much, I think, in in any type of you know workflow pipeline uh, industry experience, you know, it's like use the tools that work best. So yeah, it's actually a really good question, Charles. I'm glad you asked it because it's. You know, as we're learning new things, even myself, uh, just getting back into ZBrush again after years of being out of it, I'm realizing, you know, how, how much I could be using ZBrush more in, in my day to day. Um, and I haven't been. So, yeah, it's definitely a great, great exercise to get into. Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic question. Just start a podcast. <laughs> the Maxon podcast. Yeah, right. Cool. <laughs> So what we're going to do actually real quick, because we are running out of time and there's something I want to show you guys that is really near and dear to me. I love this part of ZBrush so much is actually surface noise and to be able to get the surface texture on something that looks really, really cool, really quickly. And as you can see, there's a lot of like gradiency. There's like a lot of like choppiness and it looks kind of muddled and cut and red and sore on this hand. And that's because I just wanted something to that looks a little corroded. Um, so what we can do to get that effect on this hand is come back up to Subtool and select our hand and then come on down to Surface, which is on the right hand side. And now we have a surface noise that we can work with. We have a few ways of doing this. We can hit Noise, which will turn on this little box and start applying some basic noise. We're going to cancel for a second, or we can hit the light box noise maker. This automatically, no matter where you were within your light box before, if you're like, let's say, in another project or you pulled a texture, if I were to come over and say light box noise makers, that automatically loads up the light box with all the different noise textures that we can manipulate. And for this one, I, you could go ahead and just double click any one that you want to kind of activate. So let's like double click this one. And I'm just going to hit the single icon for a second, bring this down. 
So you can see it's starting to apply some funky texture. If I click another one, it's gonna go ahead and turn that on. So you can see here, it's starting to showcase that I can just get some textures on these really quickly, but we're gonna need to manipulate them a little bit because out the gate, you're like, ooh, what's happening? Something looks wild. So we're actually gonna go ahead and turn noise off, which is the little button over here, surface noise. You can turn that off. And what I like to do is come here to geometry, dynamic subdivision. And once my model is all posed, let's say this is exactly what I want. This is, I'll hit apply and get some subdivisions on there. Now, if our model has UVs, surface noise does recognize UVs. We're not gonna really get too far into it for time's sake today, but just know that if you had UVs on it, it would recognize uh, your UVs. And this model actually does have UVs. So we're gonna go to surface. We have the light box open. I'm gonna double click this noise four at the top. And then I'm gonna go ahead and say edit. And now I can actually come through here and edit the noise texture itself. And you can see it's already starting to give me that effect that I want. So I'm just lowering the noise scale just a bit and maybe the strength as well. Push that in. Like I said, there is a button here for UV. So you have 3D that's default to activate. If I hit UV, if my model has UVs, it's gonna recognize those UVs. Now these aren't that great because we kind of tore this model apart to just get the hand. So the seams and everything kind of broke on it and that's okay. We're not really worried about that today. We're just going for the 3D noise and we're just going to manipulate the scale until we get something that we like. And boop, 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 boop. let's also manipulate the strength a little bit. We don't need that much. Oh, we it, it's almost Halloween. We can go full gore with it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Now, the other thing too, is we can select a color and that way we can kind of see exactly how that's gonna look. So I'm gonna have a little bit of color blend in there. So I'm gonna pick a red, that's where I want things to be choppy. And now I'm gonna go ahead and say, okay. <clears throat> and this is already how my hand is looking with the texture. And from here, I can continue sculpting on my model and it won't actually affect the noise itself. It's just going to affect the underlying surface because this is a preview. So I could turn this noise off and actually sculpt on top of it, let's say with a clay buildup. Boop, 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 boop. And then I could turn that noise back on and you'll see that my sculptural details still are there, even though that the noise is just, again, it's just a kind of uh, display of what's going on. It's only going to um, actually take effect when I say apply to mesh. If I say apply to mesh, it will actually then become part of the mesh. If I say, if I cancel that out, it's gonna, you know, control Z. Um, again, turn that on and off. It's only a preview until we hit apply to mesh. And then we can manipulate that further. Awesome. So I, don't, I, I, I don't, Go ahead. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't want to uh, cut cut off too far i know that we <laughs> we've got about seven minutes left and so there, there are a couple questions Perfect. um so would you recommend working in real world units uh for the tombstone being say 130 centimeters high um is there a way to do that specifically in zbrush there is a way to work within the units itself you have to set it but it actually does yourself a disservice to work that way um, what a lot of us will do is we will build uh, or we'll build our models with the idea of what that would actually look like. So we have a scale reference just visually. So let's right. like, for example, we're going to be bringing in our tombstone next week, but a very small preview. I'm going to load the tool and here is the tombstone that I have worked out, right? And so this is what we're going to be doing towards the end of these, these lessons. But we would grab our tombstone and I'm just going to go ahead and just paste that in there gonna just kind of gloss over that for a second again we'll cover that more in detail but a lot of us will actually come through here we'll scale up our model and we'll start to position it and we'll have an idea of what that scale is just like a visual reference but when you want to actually work within scale units again then there is a, a pipeline for that and that is utilizing our z plugin and that is utilizing our scale master, which is right here. And just to quickly kind of cover that whole thing, 
what I like to do is I like to actually have an idea of, of what, um, what the overall size of my model is going to be. So because I do a lot of toys and a lot of 3D printing, I'll actually come down here to Scale Master, and there's a button here that says New Bounding Box Subtool. And by clicking this, it's actually going to create a bounding box of my whole project. Everything that lives within my project, I hit Transpose, or, or not Transpose, um, trans, uh, Transparent. You can actually slightly see my model within the inside, and it's completely, it's completely the right size. And it gives me a, uh, it gives me that kind of cube shape. So from here, I can actually say like, if I wanted this to be, you know, uh, six feet on the y axis, because y is up and down here. So I'm going to say six, and I'm going to say feet, and then I'll say resize subtool. It's now going to scale everything. This is a massive tombstone, by the way, a six-foot tombstone. That's crazy. But hopefully <laughs> that kind of gives you an idea. And now that this whole model has been scaled up to that size, and we can actually we can actually measure that. So how we can measure that is we can actually, um, if we hit the gizmo, we'll bring that up by hitting W. There's an older tool, uh, there's an older, an older tool that we use called this calls the uh, transpose line. If I hit Y on the keyboard, that actually activates the transpose line. If I hit Y again, that brings the gizmo back, or it's just this little button up here. And the reason why we would want to switch between that, that tool and the other is that we can actually activate the tool we want to uh, measure, hit one point with this, and you can see I'm actually drawing out this line. And if I hit Shift, that's going to snap a straight line. And I can, I can measure to the other point, and then this is actually saying, how many units that is. Um, and in this case, it's a uh, 1,826 point, but we can convert that by setting scene scale. And then we could say, I want that to read six feet. And now if we come back up here at the top, it says 5.99997 feet, so six feet. So setting that scene scale. But however, now here's something to kind of point out, and this is why a lot of us that use ZBrush don't set the scene scale until we're absolutely ready is now take a look at my hand and take a look at the uh, the noise, the surface noise that we had. Because it wasn't right. set to that model, it's now set the surface noise based on the scale and that scale that has changed and therefore this has changed. So I'd have to actually come through here and start re-editing this. And at some point, if your model is ginormous, then it'll actually, you'll, you'll have to unify your actual scene um, so that it refits and you can sculpt on it because maybe your brush might seem a little too big or too small. So for the most part, I would say, you know, yes, you can do it that way. Um, I know that Cinema 4D does work with real world measurements. However, um, in ZBrush, it's more of a build your model and then set your scale and and then from there export. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Okay. We have a few questions coming in and I know we're we're running low on time. Uh, can ZBrush import assets that have rigging already applied to help in the in the posing, uh, say of the hand specifically, or things that that we need to work with? Uh, short answer: Yes. That's a long. There's a long answer to that, but yes, <laughs> right. there there are, there are pipelines for that for sure. Yes, it's a bit advanced, and it would take too long to explain for this. But short answer is yes, you can. Awesome. Um, let's see here. Does ZBrush uh, does ZBrush support multiple UVs? Um, like on the same on this like UDIMs? I, I'm assuming yeah. I'm assuming we're talking about UDIMs here. Okay. Um. Yes. Uh. Paul Gabriel is actually one who like um, who really like dove into a lot of that. Um. Again, that's a more complicated answer to get into, but short answer, yes. But there, there are, there are um, dot, dot, dots after that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for sure, for sure. Uh, okay, so the, then we had a, a quick little bit here. I answered uh, very briefly about you know how to export, say, a mask of the noise to be used in cinema. Um, you can export these textures if you apply them, um, and you can actually bake out the texture maps. So if you're needing to do something like that, like say specifically, like you don't want the baked in effects of, uh, we'll say the noise texture that you put in, uh, you can create a texture map and 
export your poly paint or bake your poly paint into the texture map to export, correct? Correct, yes. You also can export out a normal map. You can export it out a displacement map um, as well as a texture map. So yeah, you can export out multiple maps. Um, so that way you actually have, uh, you could deal with maps and just work with your low res. Yes. Awesome. So yeah, I think we'll talk about that a little bit later with, uh, I believe it's called the multi-map exporter. Uh, is the one I used something similar, <laughs> one of the Z yeah. plugins there. <laughs> but we'll talk about all of that. I know that this kind of wraps up. It's one o'clock, um, and so I want to make sure that that we're aware of the time. But I'm definitely looking forward to getting into uh, further weeks here in the month because we're going to be talking uh, a bit more about combining everything uh, next week, and then in the final week we'll be talking about how to get those into cinema 4 and red or cinema 4d and redshift with ellie and myself so that'll be fun we'll see uh quite a bit of the different processes as we work that way absolutely we're also going to cover a little bit more of live booleans next week because we have a jack-o-lantern to make from the pumpkins that i already have seen a lot of you make which is awesome i've been tagged in quite a few and i think that's fantastic so thank you for tagging me because i love seeing that stuff um so we'll be covering uh, live booleans and how we can actually um, create a jack-o'-lantern within ZBrush as well. So definitely awesome. something that's very useful, especially if you're into hard surface, live boolean is very useful. So we're gonna cover that uh, more in depth next week, so. Great, well, I'm excited for that. And uh, we, we can go ahead and, and cut it uh, here at, at 101, very slightly over, you know, as our normal. <laughs> so thank you everybody so much uh, for all of your great questions. This was a really good session and, and so much going on here. Um, yeah, this is, this is great, Ian. Thanks for another great week here. Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. This has been awesome. Thanks for welcoming me in. Uh, it's, it's really awesome to see just right now, just the tip of the iceberg of what the relationship with Cinema 4D and ZBrush can do with each other. So I'm so, super excited to keep showing everybody just like what ZBrush can do as there is a standalone program or in a, uh, in a pipeline. So again, thanks for having me. This is fantastic. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. We will see you next week. All right, goodbye, everybody. Goodbye and happy Monday. Happy Monday. <laughs>